Oh, great. Hey, good morning. How are you? We have had such a blast with Jesus the last couple of days. We always have a blast with Jesus. So good. Hey, I felt like um, I woke up this morning, and for those of you who I don't know, I, um, when I open my eyes in the morning, I, no matter where I am in the world, I ask the Lord what his word of the day is for me. And it helps me to understand what he's doing, where he's moving. Uh, helps me to keep track of where I am in the midst of moving around and flying all over and traveling and planes, trains, and automobiles and all that. And uh, it was funny. This morning when I woke up at uh, 7, I woke up at 4.30 first, and I said, what's the word of the day? And he said, honey. And I was like, oh, calling me honey. Then I went back to sleep, and I woke up, and I was like, is the word of the day seriously, honey? And he said, yes. So I just went through, I was directed by the Holy Spirit to go to Psalm 119, 103. If you have that um, verse and you want to flip it open. Um, but I have the Passion Translation version of that because it was just so sweet. And, uh, and this is what it says. How sweet are your living promises to me. Sweeter than honey is your revelation light. For your truth is the source of my understanding not the falsehoods of those who don't know you, which I despise. And I think um, when we look at that text, I just love that the honey this, the, is the word of God is the honey, but it is the word of God that brings revelation light. So when you're stuck and you're feeling like God isn't there and he's abandoned you and you have a rough time, and don't we all, right? Right? But there's waves and waves and waves of grace for all your trials and tribulations. And when you lose your way, you have to come back to the revelation light of the Word of God so you can again know how big He is and how treasured you are. So I asked him this morning, is there anything you want to say to your people at Bayshore Christian Fellowship? And all I did was write what I heard, and this is what I heard. He said... Tell them I love them. Tell them I'm smiling on them in everything they do. Some believe I scour and turn away when they make mistakes. But truly, I say to you, I will never scour and I will never turn away from you. I will never turn away from you because you are my treasures, each and every one. As far as the east is from the west, every blot, every blemish, every failure and misunderstanding, and every choice is covered. My love is too wide, long, high, and deep for you to comprehend. But in the vastness of all that I am, and in the presence of my Holy Spirit, you can obtain oneness with me and begin to believe that I am more than enough for you. Come to me in your weariness, in your fatigue. Come to me in your loneliness, in your pain. Come to me in your disappointment, in your sin, in your failures. Come to me in your busyness and in your joy. I'm always here. And then I saw the coolest picture. I saw Jesus. I saw all of you, and I saw Jesus holding up signs with each name. And on each sign, it was cracking me up. He was waving the signs in front of you like friends do when their friends are competing, like in the Olympics and things like that. Jesus had your name like, go, Mike! And he's waving it like this, waving it like this, and I was dying laughing. And he was so happy and so joyful, and he had a sign that had every one of your names on it, cheering you on in the great race that you're in. And he said, let nothing distress you, child. Choose to trust me. My word and my presence here is the truth of your situation, not your circumstances. Mystery surrounds me, yet you are not hidden from me in any way. And then he said, breathe deep and drink me in. Today, be satisfied to know you can have more, and my hope is endless. Amen. I just love Jesus. No greater cheerleader will you ever have. 
So let's talk about faith, okay? How about faith? Faith in the hard stuff? Because you have the freedom to choose every day. So in my words of the day, when I'm all over the world, I say, God, show me something new. Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I'll answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you don't know. So all the time I'm going, God, tell me something great and unsearchable because I'm so tired. You know, if I've been ministering for two weeks straight, 15 hours a day, I'm wiped. I'm wiped. And I'm like, I have no perspective right now. I'm so out of it. And I will ask him to tell me something great. And I was up in the Northwest. I'd just come back from, uh, from, uh, England, and I went straight to Washington State, and I was sitting, waiting on the Lord, because I had to go preach, and I just was like, wow, I was jet lagged, and I, I just was like, I know you're going to show up, but I need you to show up big this morning, because I have no idea where I am, and I don't even know what my name is, and I said, what's the word of the day, and he was not helpful, really, in that moment, he wasn't, because sometimes he'll make you dig a little bit, Amen. Because when you dig a little bit, you own it. So do not despise when he doesn't give you everything you want right then because he's trying to get you to come closer. He's not chastising you. He's, he's wooing you, all right? Don't be deceived. So he goes, I said, okay, so what's the word of the day? Can we just start there? And he goes, the word of the day is reckless. I go, wah, wah, wah. That does not help me one bit. I don't like that word. I grew up without being allowed to use that word. My family was militant, military. We don't use the word reckless at all. I don't like that word. And he says, whoa, your faith needs to be reckless. And then I went, that doesn't help me either. I do not understand the word reckless except for the word that my dad used to say, and there better never be anything in your behavior that's reckless, and your driving better never be reckless, and you better get everything, you know, ducks in the row and all of that. I mean, we were, my upbringing was like, sir, you know, you had to get all the wrinkles out of your bed, and clothes had to be hung in your drawers. I'm serious. My dad would open our drawers, and they had to be all neat. Everything had to be stacked. You know, the only thing he didn't do was color coordinated because he was colorblind. Hallelujah. <laughs> So I didn't like it. And the Lord, the Lord is wooing me. I could just feel him smiling right here. Oh, by the way, while we were in worship, I'm having, I'm having a squirrel moment. While we were in worship, I asked the Lord, do you ask the Lord things like, hey, what's going on in the room? You should, because he'll show you or give you an impression or you'll get a feeling or you'll get a word or you'll get a verse. And so we were learning that this weekend. So I said to him, what's going on in the room? And I got an instant picture of the angels of God going up and down the aisles like this, inside and outside. You know, they can pass through you, okay? So they weren't needing to go, excuse me, pardon me, over you. They just walked right through you, and they had these buckets. And I've not seen this before. They had buckets, and the buckets was, it, in the buckets was gold, the presence of the Lord, and they were throwing it on you. I never see, I've never seen that. And I just sat there and laughed. Then I had to sit down because the glory was like, whew. Okay. Ask and you will receive. The Lord says, you're mine and you're supernatural. So why don't you ask me what's going on in the supernatural? And I will open up your eyes, your spiritual eyes, and you will see the truth. And the truth will make you free because your perspective will shift instantly. Amen? All right. So as I am being wooed by the Lord in my reckless word in that morning, he said, okay, your faith needs to be reckless. So I said, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll go with it. All right, I will listen. And he said, I want you to look up the meaning of these words, and then you will understand what I'm trying to tell you. So I am a research junkie. I watch documentaries in my spare time. I know, it's weird, but I'm a data person. I love data, I love logistics. That doesn't seem like it goes together with the Holy Spirit, but it does, it's part of him. So he said to me, look this up. So I look up what faith means, and it means complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Can you, can we all agree on that? that that's pretty good. Okay, then the second one is, um, the second meaning is strong belief in God or in the doctrines of religion. Yeah, we're still good? Okay, how about reckless? These are the definitions that are most common, dictionary.com, without thinking or caring about the consequences of an action. Is that, do you understand that one? Okay, the next one is Merriam-Webster, everyone's favorite. Okay, marked by lack of proper caution, careless of consequences. We good? How about the one we use for kids all the time? Irresponsible. 
That's the one I heard my whole life. The Lord is about to rewrite your understanding, as he did mine, of who he really is and what faith really looks like. So let me show you what he showed me. Reckless synonyms. Listen. Impulsive. Audacious. Bold, daring, courageous, fearless. Over-adventurous, adventurous, impetuous. Reckless faith, if it really influenced our Christian doctrine, might sound something like this. This is what I heard the Holy Spirit say. I just wrote it down. I can tell you I'm not this smart, so it has to be the Lord. If reckless faith influenced our walk with God, it would sound something like this. Living without cultural or religiously influenced caution by taking bold, daring, fearless, Holy Spirit-inspired, loving action to do what Jesus said I would do regardless of the consequences to me. Can I read that to you again? Living without cultural or religiously influenced caution by taking bold, daring, fearless, Holy Spirit-inspired, loving action to do what Jesus said I would do regardless of the consequences to me. That's some audacious faith right there. So I might not be super popular in many places with that definition. But I don't care. Because I believe that's what Jesus modeled. Reckless faith, it shows with what Jesus said we were built for reckless faith. It was what was modeled for us. It was what we were created for. It's what he paid for, but it's only born through intimacy with our Father in heaven. And then we know the inheritance we were given. Amen? Reckless faith is necessary for signs, wonders, and miracles to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ, period. We have to get it. When we know Hebrews 11.6, you know this. Without faith, it's impossible to what? Please God. How about James 2.14-26? through 26? Faith without works is what? It's dead. Without faith, we don't have it. And then we look through Scripture. So here's my next part of my adventure with reckless. The Lord takes me all the way through Scripture. And makes me look up every single person who had faith. It was a long journey. And here's what I found out. Old Testament examples involve men and women who chose to act in faith in the middle of violent circumstances. Sometimes their immediate action was to carry out unpleasant and distressing directions from heaven among cowardly peers and impending evil on all sides. And I can't even pray for somebody in the Starbucks line. There's not really impending evil on every side. And I'm not going to get my head chopped off. I just don't want to be wrong, and I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to be inconvenienced. I don't want to do inner healing for three hours. Whatever the deal is, I just find a reason why I don't want to step out, right? So let's look at some of our great heroes of the Bible so you can feel a little bit better about when you pass by that opportunity that Jesus just invites you in. And I really believe that after you hear this, you're going to do that a little bit less each time he gives you an invitation. So let's look at Joshua and Caleb in Numbers 13 and 14, and I'm going to paraphrase for time. But there are 12 men at this cha in these chapters. 12 men are sent to explore the land that the Lord has already given to the people of Israel, right? So the Lord said, I gave you this land. Now you spies go out and just see what's happening there and report back. So 12 men are sent to explore the land, but 10 of them cowered. That's what the word says. They invented a connection of the people that they saw there to the giants, to the Nephilim, and they spread, listen, they spread their opinions of fear rather than simply relaying their observations. That has never happened to us. Spread my opinion of fear rather than simply relaying what's really happening. They failed because of fear. The fear that their emotions caused them because their emotions were running wild with panic. Anyone? 
We can go from zero to 60 in about one and a half seconds with fear in our minds. So meanwhile, we have heroes, Joshua and Caleb, who stood firm in reckless faith and trusted the Lord at what? He, they trusted the Lord at his word. The Lord said, I gave you the land. I gave you the land, didn't I? So they reported back their observations without any panic. They just said, hey, here's what we saw. And then they prevailed. And later, Caleb was singled out as having a model spirit. I love that. In Numbers 14, 24. And Joshua becomes the leader after the death of Moses. I can tell you, throughout Scripture, you will see that God spiritually promotes the ones who continually trust him. He does. That's his promise. Trust me. Choose me. Choose me, choose me, choose me. Risk equals maturity. No risk. We stay babies. We have to keep risking to grow because we find out how big our Lord is when we risk. Amen? Okay, let's look at Joshua again. And Joshua 10, 12 and verses 12 and 13. Joshua, I have a couple slides I want to show you um, as soon as I tell you this. Joshua prays to God for the sun to stand still so the Israelites will defeat the Amorites. Do you pray audacious prayers like that? Do you? I never did. Okay, so then I went to Brazil. And we're going to have this crusade in Brazil, and the storm is raging outside. And I'm in Brazil with Randy Clark. And he comes out and he goes, man, if, they, if this storm doesn't lift, we're done because we can't do this with the, with the um, lightning that's coming down. It'll fry the equipment. And so we all go out, and I'm standing there, and it's pouring. And there's 50 of us. And the, about 35 people just run out into the middle of the storm. And they stand there with their hands up like this. Do you have that first slide? It looks like the so storm clouds are over. I don't know if you have that. And they're, they're standing there and they're yelling at the sky. And I'm thinking, what a freak show. I'm not doing that. Okay, no, that's not. So it looks like storm clouds over top. We will show this in a little bit. So they're standing there. They're yelling at the sky and they're saying, in Jesus' name, I command the skies to open and clear. Okay, so that's the second one after it starts to clear. So there will be one with it's just all cloudy, not that one. It's the one before that. <laughs> it's so good. No worries. No worries. Okay, so here it is. This is when it starts to get light. If I had had the picture, if I could have found it, the picture where it's just completely black, the sky's black. So do you see these people? They're all like, la, 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 speaking in tongues, yelling to the sky. And this woman, Emily, is the, is the ringleader right there in the corner. Emily's like, this is not going to happen. I came to Brazil to pray for the sick and watch people get saved. This is not going to happen. She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And as everybody's praying, I'm going, well, I'm going to have some of that. I've never done that. So I ran out there with them. And I became a maniac just like them. And then the next slide is where it starts to part. So the one where you, the, of the stage, the slide that you had. Okay, right here. This is what's happening. Do you see everybody's hands up and everybody is yelling, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command everything. All the storm, all of the assignments, move. And we watched the sky. I've never seen anything like it. We watched the sky part. All the clouds went back. And it was pouring, thundering lightning all around except in the park where thousands of people had gathered to hear the word of the Lord. And I had never seen such audacious faith in all my life and because of these people and their faith, I then had that kind of faith because faith is contagious. Amen? So then the next picture is the one that's kind of a yellowy tinge where I was praying for some people. So here is where there are lines and lines of people with cancer. We had just seen, when I went there, we had just seen our eighth case of stage four cancer healed. And I was fired up. I'm like, bring me, the, bring me every person in here with cancer. We're going to pray for them. So we had a whole line of people praying. And we found out later that there, this guy got healed, completely radically healed. And we were, pray, we were praying for pictures of people. We just had so much faith after watching the Lord God Almighty part the skies. And that's what we read about in the Old Testament. You can do the same. Thanks for that. We'll have some more pictures in just a second. So then we go on to see Moses and Aaron at Exodus 5, 1 through 21. So Moses is 80 years old. Can you imagine? He's 80. And he and his brother are persuaded by the Lord in Exodus 3 and 4 to go to Pharaoh and ask for the Israelites to get a vacation. What? They don't, the Israelites hate Moses and Aaron. They don't, 
they have Pharaoh, they have the Egyptians, they have the Israelites, and everybody is against them, and they still do what God asks them to do because they trust God at his word. When God asks me to pray for somebody in the airport, there are a whole lot less people against me than Moses and Aaron. And sometimes I go, mm, don't want to. Not so much anymore, but this was in the beginning. I used to go, mm, I'm tired. I'm not doing that. Now I know if I don't do it, I'm the one that misses out. I'm the one that misses out. I have encounters that are so insane when I just say yes, and so will you. He doesn't need you to work it up and, and all that stuff. Just stand. Stand and believe and watch him work. I will tell you, I went into the Heathrow Airport. I'm in London all the time. And I said to the Lord, all right, we were flying to Belfast. And I said, I I'll pray for anybody. You want me to pray? I'll pray for anybody. Sometimes I'm like that. And I, I said, bring it on. And Ka I was with it. Kathy, another gal on our board. And she looks at me. She goes, so? I go, yeah. We don't even have to talk because we travel together all the time. She goes, so we're going to? I go, yeah. So then in walk two flak-jacketed, gunslinging cops, police officers at Heathrow are no joke. Like, those guys will stun gun you and shoot you in the head. I mean, they are like, they're, and they carry more than 50 pounds of gear every day, all day. So I'm in the coffee shop, because this is how, how real this gets. I'm in the coffee shop. I just ordered my coffee. I'm standing on the side, and I had just said, Lord, I don't care. Bring it on. I'll pray for somebody. And then walk these two cops. And they just start saying to each other, you know, man, my back, my back pain, my back pain. I'm like, it was not a word of knowledge. I just heard them say, I have back pain. So I, I'm, I look at Kathy, and she starts laughing. I go, here we go. So I walk over. I go, hey, excuse me, you have back pain? They go, yes. I go, I just heard you talking. They have back pain. I go, well, we, we believe that, um, that God heals people today. Jesus heals, and so we want to pray for you. And they have really crazy, fun accents, and they're like, right here? I go, well, yeah, order your coffee first, and then we'll pray for you. And they're like, I go, we won't be weird. And they're like, <laughs> okay. They order their coffee, and they move down the counter. And now the baristas are looking at us like, what are you doing, clogging the line and all that? So we move further down. And I don't ask permission, which is not normally like me, but I just slip my hand up under his flak jacket. I just did that. I just went, hey, let me just do, and he's like, Wah. I go, let me just pray for you. So I just said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command all this back pain to leave. And I took my hand away. I go, hey, check out your back. Just do something. And he goes like this. What? What? I feel a wee bit of heat. And I started laughing. He must be Irish. <laughs> so... He goes, I feel, I feel heat. And I go, that's right. I go, is your pain better? He goes, it's better. I go, let me pray one more time. Put my hand behind his back. And Kathy's melting in half laughing so hard because I'm just so brazen. It's ridiculous. So I pray for him again. And I tell all the pain to go. And he goes, I, so now try something radical. Like, I'm serious. He's got the baton. He's got the gun. He's got the flak jacket. He's got the, it, they're just weighted everywhere. And he bends down and he looks at his partner. And, it, and he goes, no way, no way, I don't have any pain. And his partner goes, thank the Lord Jesus, I don't have to listen to you anymore. <laughs> I laughed so hard. These guys have been working together for 15 years on this, this detail at Heathrow Airport, and this guy has been listening to this guy complain for years. And he's like, thank you, God, thank you, God. Very, very, very Catholic. So then Kathy's very sweet, and she goes, well, excuse me, you have back pain too, right? And he goes, yes the other guy. She goes, well, let me, can, is it okay if I touch your back? So he goes, okay. So she prays for him exact same way. I'm literally, now we're not even up to five minutes by this time. Like we're maybe three minutes in. He gets radically healed the first time she prays. And the two of them are absolutely, they look like they got hit with a stun gun. They're like, what just happened to us? And we said, hey, bless you guys. You know, Jesus loves you. He's the one who healed you. And we got to go drink our coffees because ours is getting cold. And they're like, just standing there like this with their mouths open. And the baristas are like this too. <laughs> this is what happens when God starts moving. So we go off to our table, and we sit there, and now we got to go because our, our plane is getting ready to board. So we get up, and we see them walking towards us. They had gone to the back of the coffee shop, and they, walk, and they said, so um, do you come here often? <laughs> Classic line. I go, oh, yeah, we just hang out in the airport and pray for people. No, we don't. No. I go, we come here, you know, six times a year or more. Or more. And uh, they go, well, when will you be coming back through here? I go, why? Do you want to bring a bunch of your officer friends? And they said, yeah, we do. I want you to know, um, although we didn't connect with those specific 
uh, police officers again. I do believe we'll see them again because that's their regular route and we're going actually in a week. We'll be there again. You have to know that the invitation's always there and you will be the one who is so radically and boldly blessed and you will have joy, unbelievable joy that comes from just simply going, I'm in, I'll do it. I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'll do it. Whatever you want me to do, I will do that. When you look at people like Gideon, come on, you have to have faith. Gideon in Judges chapter 7, he is in the army and he's got this whole thing whittled down to 300 men and Gideon is the least of the least of the tribe of Israel, hiding. And God goes, Gideon, mighty man of God. Gideon is, <laughs> doesn't he make you feel better? He's hiding. Oh God, please don't anybody see me. Mighty man of God, come on, you're going to lead an army. Me? Don't you know who I am, God? I'm the least of the least. God goes, come on, you're my champion. And with 300 men, Gideon defeats the army of the Midianites, 120,000. Do you feel better? Yeah. I just, I, I just, blows, I read that chapter and I just go, when he screams and has them blow their trumpets and crash their pots, to the Lord and for Gideon. I'm like, what? I can't get that. I'm sure it's cultural, but I just don't get it. I'm like, this little shrinking man comes out and goes, for the Lord and for Gideon, blow your trumpets. I mean, how transformational is a moment with God when you say yes and choose to believe who he is. How about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? No smell of smoke. Go ahead, get in the fire. Jesus is right in there with you, no smell of smoke. How about Rahab and Jeremiah, Phineas, Ehud, David? How about Jonathan? He's supposed to be the heir to the throne, and he's promoting somebody else. Oh, there's a lesson for me. I look at Daniel's life. Daniel was framed by the administrators and provincial governors to worship King Darius. And he didn't do it. And he goes to the lion's den and he never backed away. And he never manipulated his situation either. And that is something we need for today. He never stepped back. He never manipulated and he never manipulated the favor he had with King Darius either. He would just talk, he talked straight. He talked straight, and God saved him. How about the New Testament? How about John the Baptist? Would you like to be that guy? Would you like to wear those weird clothes? I just couldn't deal with the scratchiness of that camel thing. I just couldn't. He's only six months older than Jesus, and he's assigned to the role of scout for the followers of Jesus to come. He is so weird. He is so weird, and we cannot pray for people in Target. What's the matter? We look just like everybody else. We're not having to eat honey and probably smell and wear camel hair clothes, and we're told to go and do these wild things. We're just told to go be kind. That's a kingdom principle, be kind. I, I look at John chapter 2, verses 12 through 25, where Jesus is turning over the money changer tables in the temple. This is a big deal. The high priests allowed Passover to become a time of money-making even for their own gain. Jesus, when he overturns the tables, he undermines their earning potential. There is a very high cost for that. And Jesus does this over and over and over, takes a stand against the religious ones. We are to take that same stand, but the stand that we take is through love. Unconditional love. Love the ones you think you cannot. The woman with the issue of blood, at the cost of being stoned to death, comes to Jesus for her healing. He could have let her sneak away. He could have let her touch the hem of his robe and then just go off. Do you know why he didn't do that? I will, I will just put this out there to you. He made her come around in front of him, face him, face to face. He's a rabbi. He's the only one who could say, you are clean. Do you know that that woman was shut away for 12 years, cost her everything she had? She was unclean, couldn't come into society for fear of being stoned. Do you know how rejected? Talk about a spirit of rejection. Come on. But the power of testimony breaks that down because she heard about the rabbi rolling through town. But miracles were happening, so she comes out at the risk of being killed, dives down, grabs his garment, goes, I got mine. 
But Jesus wouldn't let her steal it because then the enemy might have a trump card to say, really? Are you really healed? Really? You stole that because that's what he loves to do. Just put a little shred of doubt on you and then you go, yeah, I'll buy that. And then the next thing you know, you've lost your healing. No, he pronounced her so-zo, you are healed, mind, body, soul, done. Then the next time somebody tries to reject that woman, she goes, not today, which is what we need to learn to do. Amen? Amen. All right. Uh, I want to, uh, to talk about response of people in faith. Um, I was just in uh, New Zealand, and... uh, I do some stuff with YWAMers. I love YWAMers. They are just out to lunch. I mean, seriously. They are so cute. And um, they just love Jesus. And a lot of them uh, get sent to YWAM bases by their parents or their grandparents. That's kind of a fix this child. Fix this young adult. I have no idea what to do with them anymore. A lot of them are drug addicts. And they get there and they're like, "Eh, whatever. I don't know. So I'm going to have you put up that slide. Uh, There's a slide... um, I'm going to call this kid Marcus, even though that's not his name. So he has a beard, and in the first picture, he has guys praying for him. So can you guys throw up those slides? So in this first picture, I don't know if they can hear me up there. Okay, so in this first picture, this this guy that has a black beard, (laughs) he's got guys praying for him. Okay, so this I'm going to call this guy Marcus with the HSA shirt on. So, so the kid with the red hair, that's a guy with the red hair, and the guy with the plaid shirt, and this other guy, these two guys are from Canada. Now, these three right here, this other guy seems to be like, he, he pretty much knows Jesus. These three right here, train wreck. I'm not kidding you. Totally, these three <laughs> have no idea why they're really at YWAM. I'm not sure they're saved, actually, until later. This kid got a drive-by prophetic word from us uh, with a beard the day before where I said, hey, you're an adrenaline junkie and blah, 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 and you got this. And actually, you came from New Jersey. He's from New Jersey. It was very weird. So he's like, who are you? He didn't know I was speaking that week. So this is the next day when they're learning how to pray for each other. So this kid with the beard ends up getting radically healed of hip pain and back pain. He jumped off a cliff. He is an adrenaline junkie and skinned his skin off from his hamstring all the way up over his butt cheek, and it was just awful. He he couldn't sit down at all. So these two guys, who have no idea what they're doing, pray after learning simply, pray in the name of Jesus. And so the next picture goes in sequence. There's a picture of, okay, he just got healed, and he can't figure out, look at his face. He's like, what the, what just happened to me? And this guy who's got his hand like this, he's like, And he kept saying, I'm the one that prayed. I'm the one that prayed. I'm like, yes, even you, sweetie. Even you. God can use even you. Because he came there after having had lots and lots of not so awesome things happen to him in Canada. Get the picture? His mother sent him there. Fix this boy. This boy has no idea what just happened. He just knows all he said was what we told him to say was all the pain get out right now in Jesus' name. Okay, next one. Okay, so this is Marcus. He's still got his pant leg rolled up because he just showed it all. I'm like, TMI, buddy. Put your pant thing down over your butt cheek. He pulled it all the way up goes, look at this. I don't have any pain. He's standing there, so that's me. Look at this kid here. He's like, is this going to be on social media? I think I'm wanted in five states. I mean, he is so nervous right now that our photographer is taking pictures. So this guy, Marcus, has got his hand out like this. He's testifying to the goodness of God who just healed him, but his hand is lit up like a disco ball with the glory of God. And he cannot figure out with his right mind what in the world has happened to him. So I'm trying to explain to him while he's giving the testimony that he's been touched powerfully by God and he's just shaking. Okay, so the next one is me prophesying the rest of the story of his destiny over his life. Okay. So the last night that I'm there in New Zealand, there's a community meeting, and it's a covenant meeting between a Bible college and YWAM where they're forming an alliance on a property that the Lord had given to the Bible college so that there's going to be teaching from both YWAM and the Bible college. It's it's a big deal in the community. So at that thing, 
the Lord says to me in the middle of worship, go find these young guys. Find out where they are and see what they're doing. I was like, what a weird thing. I'll, I'll go do that. So I go wander around from the back of the church. I come all the way around, and they're sitting in about the fifth row, and they're all together now. They found a tribe, these guys. I would have never put them together in a million years because they're all troublemakers. But now they're all a tribe because Jesus healed everybody they prayed for. So I say to them, because I had seen a man with a red hat and a cane sitting in the back, and the Lord said, he has horrible pain to me when I walked by. So I go up to these guys. I find them here in the middle of worship, and I go, gentlemen? And they go, yes. I go, there's a man back there with a red hat and a cane. I had better see all of you praying for him before the night is over. You got that? And they go, boys, with their elbows, we got an assignment. I'm like, I just love being an old lady. This is so good. People do what you say. So... They don't even wait till I get back to my seat. They get up right then. They go to the back of the church. So the next picture is them praying. Okay, so here is Marcus praying for the man. I mean, they're killing me. They went from being the most disastrous set of boys in the class, cutting up, constantly screwing up, to this. And then the next picture is all of them. And I'm crying watching this. This is one day. One day they pray for the sick and everybody gets healed. Now they're doing this. And the Lord tells me these are the leaders of the next discipleship training school. So I walked up to their leaders and I said, excuse me, the rebels, they're your leaders for the next session. And they go, we know the Lord told us this morning. So as they're praying for this guy, they go, they finish, they go back to their seat and I go back there. This is all going on during worship. And I go, so? And they look at me and they are crying. These big, tough, very in trouble before they came to YWAM guys are crying and they say, you're never going to believe it. I go, try me. I probably will. They go, that guy got healed. Joe, he's like, he's been in pain for like 15 years. And we, and, and the, guy in the, the guy right here with the reddish hair, he's the crazy one with his hands on his head like this all the time. He goes, I healed him, Joe. I healed him. I go, well, technically, <laughs> Jesus healed him. But yes, you were the one that prayed. You were the one that prayed. He goes, but, and he's crying. He goes, but it's, but there's more. And I go, oh, okay, tell me. They go, today in our dorm after we went, after we went to class and you taught us all that stuff, we went back to the dorm. We were talking about how crazy it is that Jesus heals everybody. And he goes, and then this girl came by because you told us how to hear the voice of God. And she was practicing because you told everybody to do those drive-bys. So she drove by with her, she goes, hey, you boys, I'm, she was practicing. She goes, you're, the four of you are going to pray for a man with a red hat today, and God's going to heal him. That's what made him cry. They couldn't believe how much God was speaking to them and then through them. And those kids, I am telling you, they are 24, 22. They can't shut them up now. They want to go do evangelism every day. They want to go down into the city and pray for everybody. And before they were like this, just show me something. This is the power of God with radical, reckless faith. Amen? So good. Let me read you a reaction that Peter and John have in Acts 4, 1 through 22. You can follow along. I learned so much from this as we go around the world in the word of God is exactly what we are to do today. So listen to this. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came to them. This is Peter and John. Greatly annoyed because Peter and John are teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So what did they do? They arrested them, put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening. And many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Proclamation of the word of God and the experience of healing. Jesus had both the presence, manifestations of signs, wonders, and miracles and the preaching of the word. He never did one without the other. So they're doing the same. The numbered men who gave their lives is 5,000. They don't even count the women and the children at that time. And then verse 5, on the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were in the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? 
Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders. If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whoops, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among by which men will be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. Feeling better already? I know, we all are. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Just like Marcus had the glory all over him, so do you when you've spent time in intimacy with God. Verse 14, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. What are you going to say? The guy's standing right there. He's totally healed. What are you going to say? But when they commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, what are we going to do with these men? What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and they charged them and they said, you are not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And here's what Peter and John had to say. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Reckless faith opens the door for Jesus to come and use you and me to do marvelous, amazing, miracle signs and wonders. And he does it through the ordinary, the ordinary every day. Every place in Scripture you see, before Jesus does the miracles, where is he? He goes away to be with the Father, to be with the Father, to be with the Father. If we don't spend time with the Father, we end up becoming people of works, striving, believing that we had actually something to do with it, or that we failed because we had something to do with it. Our team travels all over the place. We have 60 prayer ministers all over the world now. We have 40 intercessors because nothing happens without prayer. I will not leave my house without prayer, and I don't want to go around the world without people praying for me. It's too ridiculous. Faith is what moves mountains, but prayer brings faith. Amen? So I just believe that everything that we need is in the Word of God because every time I look at Jesus, he's back with the Father. And when I'm feeling doubt, God told me one day, doubt is drought. And I said, what is that? He goes, a drought of my love. You have a drought of my love in your heart, or you wouldn't have doubt. You would know. So I want you to just sit with your eyes closed for just a second. And I want you to just ask Jesus this question. Just say, Lord, what prevents me from walking fearlessly? What prevents me to, from doing that? Fear of what people will think. Think you're not good enough. Got too much going on in your life. So keep your eyes closed. So you always have choices and you always have invitations from God because he is such a gentleman and so in love with you. So if you are ready, I want you to say, Lord, just repeat after me. Lord, I want to walk fearlessly with you. So I give this limitation. 
I give you this fear. I give you doubt. I give you performance. I give you my family history. I give you my fear of being wrong. And I want you to just imagine the Lord in front of you in some manner, however your imagination brings Jesus forward. And I want you to see yourself giving him all that junk. Some days you feel like you ought to just take your brain out of your head and just hand him your brain. <laughs> and say, Jesus, you're the giver of good gifts. You make beauty from ashes. So I give you my ash pile. And I receive your gift. And just watch or just sit for just a second. Some of you will see him actually give you a gift. Some of you will feel something. Some of you will think something. And some of you will just have a ray of hope. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And just say, Jesus, I receive the beauty you have for me. and the overwhelming love and acceptance you have for me even when I don't do what you say. Okay, you can open your eyes. When you choose the Father's presence, you get to be the hands and the feet, the hugs and the words of Jesus to the most hurting people in the world. And sometimes we're the most hurting people. Right? That's why you're part of this family, because we bear one another's burdens every day. We pray for one another. We lift one another up so that you know when you can be in a season of rest and when you can be in a season of promotion, when you are in a season of acceleration, when you are in a season of just knowing there are going to be fearless ones among you who also need a rest. And then the next crew gets to be going out and being the fearless ones. There is no condemnation in Christ when there needs to be a break. And that is why we can't depend completely on our pastor's to give us everything. I say this in every church in the world. We are a body of believers to carry the load together, which isn't a load because Jesus carries it all. Amen? I want to leave you with this story, and then we're going to pray for you, okay? We were um, back in England a couple months ago, and uh, was, was doing this uh, crusade setting thing outside, and... Um, I came out, I had to go from one tent to another tent to speak, and I had literally like five minutes. And so our team was all scrambling to get out of one tent, following me, I'm running across this field, and I can feel somebody behind me, but it's not my team, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I can feel something dark behind, I'm like, the. And I turn around, and there is a girl dressed in, uh, wow, all, all I can say is it, looked like something out of a movie set. It was like shredded kind of black hanging clothes and she's just loaded with crystals around her neck and her eyes are like a cat, bright yellow. I go, well, hi. And she goes, I just need to, I just need, and she's like, 
oh, very trance-like, completely possessed. I just need to hug you. I'm like, I just smiled at her. My team is like this behind her. Don't, don't, don't let her hug you. I'm like, let her hug me. I'm, I'm right now, the reason why she wants to come hug me is because she knows. The girl knows Jesus. The demons are like, come on, get back. And I go, come here, come here, come here. And my team's like this. Oh, oh. I go, stop it. I go, come here. And she's like this. <gasps> it was like the breath of life in this girl. And I had to go. So I said, sweetie, I'm gonna ha- you walk with one of our team back over to this other tent, and she's going to connect you with somebody, okay? Just, just for this time, because i got to go over here. And she's like this. Her eyes are still bright yellow. She's still completely demonized. And the team member takes her back in there. I want you to know, because of the type of people like this, this type of family that we were ministering with, that girl, by the end of the third day, her eyes were green. She came in jeans and a sweatshirt. She was a completely and totally different person. And she went through the fire tunnel at the end of the whole crusade (laughs) five times. She couldn't stop. She was like, I've never had anything. Oh, I mean, she was just free. And we were able to prophesy destiny over this girl. And every spirit of witchcraft that she had involved herself in was completely annihilated. But to watch the transformation power of Jesus change the color of someone's eyes, I want you to know it's on you. That's what's on your life. I didn't have to do anything hard. I opened my arms and knew my God is bigger. I didn't have fear. This is a lost little girl. I think she was all of 21 years old. She'd been in the occult her whole life. What kind of chance do those people have unless we bring the light of Christ to them? And they're all over this place. When you drive through these beach cities, you can feel it. There's a poverty spirit here and a spirit of addiction that is so strong. But Jesus is bigger. So I want you to stand up. We're going to pray. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are already here. You've been here. You dwell here. You live here. God, I thank you that you are the God of the impossible. 